Uh, quickly about myself, I'm an atheist. Um, I do a little bitty podcast with my friend Dean called The Canadian Atheist. Uh, we like talking to believers and covering, uh, covering news about uh, silly things that uh, believers do and say. Um, I generally don't care how people use the word atheist. Different people use it in different ways. Myself, I like to ask people uh, what they mean by it, and then I address them accordingly. I don't find the term nearly as controversial as some do. I do take the positive position. Um, I believe gods do not exist. I'm most convinced of this when, as it pertains to the Christian God. And I say this because it's the God I'm most familiar with and prevalent where I live. Uh, tonight has to do with uh, secular versus Christian ethics or morality, whatever you want to call it. And to be clear, uh, secular, not atheist. Atheism is an answer to a single question and in no way speaks to morality. You can be a moral atheist and you can be an immoral one. You can also be a moral question, Christian and certainly an immoral one as well. Uh, one thing I don't want to do tonight is waste time stuck in the mud. Uh, since I'm speaking to a Christian, for the purposes uh, of this dialogue and hopefully for some meaningful discussion, I'm going to accept that Jim's very particular God exists and that the Bible is an accurate representation of him and history. This means you may hear me say things that an atheist would not say. Don't worry. It's just for this discussion. My stance is secular uh, ethics, um, ethics not dependent on a God, is not only vastly superior to a theistic uh, set, uh, but that theistic morality is, and specifically Christian, since that's the take of my friend, uh, is immoral on the whole. I say this because Christians believe the Bible. They follow the Bible. They vote based on biblical principles. They lobby to see laws passed uh, that are in line with uh, their biblical views, marginalizing segments of the population, uh, as they see as not right or disagreeable or sinful. I've always found it very interesting that a believer's God always loves the same things they do and hates the same things that they do. I don't remember where I read that, but I found it to be very true. So if you're gonna build uh, a moral or ethical framework, uh, you should start with a foundation. I use the foundation of well-being. I define well-being as a reduction of suffering to the best of our ability, while at the same time promoting flourishing to the best of our ability. Some use a state of uh, balance uh, in being healthy and happy mentally and physically. And that seems fine too. It also involves avoiding the involuntary imposition of your will onto others who cannot or do not consent. Um, utilizing the veil of ignorance developed by philosopher John Rawls uh, can also be used here. And lastly, consequential ethics, uh, which is clearly the understanding that your actions have consequences, good and bad, on fellow creatures. <laughs> Pardon me. I personally am not convinced that that morals are or ethics are totally objective or subjective. I think there are good arguments for both sides. Um, I think there are times when things are always wrong, like for example, torturing a baby for one's own personal pleasure. Um, and I also think that there are times when things are only sometimes wrong, like lying. We are told, and some would have us believe, that the God of the Bible is not only the foundation of ethics and morality, but that it also comes from him. This in mind, I'm curious how Jim will answer the Euthyphro dilemma. Uh, for anyone unaware, uh, it simply asks, does God say something because it is good? Or is it good simply because he says it? This is a sticky problem. If God says it because it's good, then, it, then the morality or ethics can't come from him, and it must be outside of him. And the alternative is, whatever he says is good. And why? Well, because, and in reality, there can be nothing more arbitrary than that. I'm sure we all remember our parental figures telling us, because I said so. Uh, I'm sure you liked it a lot, and I know I found it particularly satisfying. So accepting Jim's claim that his God exists, all that is left to do is look at the evidence, which is, in this case, the Bible, and then judge this God accordingly. Yes, I said judge. We can totally judge God. Not because we're angry or out of hatred. I don't hate God any more than I hate Voldemort. Uh, not because we love our sin. Sin is made up. Um, but judge based on actions and in some cases inactions. After all, Ephesians 1.11 says, and this is paraphrased, but everything is done for his purpose. So are his actions in line with what is good? Does he seek to avoid suffering and promote flourishing? Well, not according to 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14, where he stops the rains and said, sends locusts and plagues on people. 
not like it will apparently be in Revelation 15, where seven angels will bring seven plagues, not in Leviticus 26, where if you piss him off, he'll just continue to send pestilences and earthquakes and famine. The list goes on. Does he avoid the involuntary imposition of his will unto others who cannot or do not consent? Well, not according to Exodus 7, where he hardened Pharaoh's heart, nor in Romans 9, where he declares that he has mercy on those he desires and hardens those he desires. I'm not going to take up any more time with this, but really, all we need to do is the Bible. The book for which we are agreeing for the purposes of this discussion is true, and see that God represented there is immoral, worthy of only of our condemnation and disdain. That's it. Thanks. Thank you so right. much. And the floor is all yours, Mr. Batman. Thanks as well for being here. Thank you very much, James. It's always a pleasure. And again, I am Mr. Batman. I'm what's called a Torah observant Christian. I kind of like, don't like that term. Some people call me Hebrew roots. Don't like that term either. It's there because they're both very redundant. Being a Christian means doing what the word of God says do. That's it. You know, that's all there is to it. This book right here is where we can find all truth, wisdom, and knowledge. Now, I'm really glad that Michael is going to take the stance that this word of God is true because it says it's true and it is true. You can trust it. Psalm 119 verse 160 says, for the sum of, that would be all of it, the sum of your word is truth and all of your righteous rulings endure forever. I'm actually going to read a little bit from the scripture because since we both agree that it's true, then we can understand what God's will is for us by reading it. In Psalm chapter one, verse one, it says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. I like the original wording, in the Torah of Yahuwah, and his law, on, and in his law, he meditates on it day and night, thinking about how better to observe it, how better to do it. He will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. You see, God's word is a blessing and a curse. God even says this. He says, I put before you this day life and death. That's the Torah. That's God's instructions. That's his law. Blessings and curses. Life and blessings if you obey. Death and curses if you don't. I agree with that wholeheartedly, Michael, because it's called a cause and effect relationship. But let's look at uh, verse four. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You see, without the word of God, our schoolmaster, as Paul puts it in Romans, that the, the Torah is our schoolmaster, then you can't define what is good. You can't define what is bad because God is the foundation for what is good. You see, without God, there is no good. Without God, there is no truth. You know, when you look also, it says in Psalm chapter five, verse four, it says, for you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells in you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all workers of iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord, Yahuwah, abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. But as for me, by your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house. At your holy temple, I will bow in reverence to you. And then you go down to verse 12. For it is you who blesses the righteous man. O Lord, O Yahuwah, you surround him with favor as a shield. God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. God is angry with the wicked every day. But his mercies are new every day. He is patient with us. He wants us to repent. But he also knows those who will and will not. If a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. That is God, capital H. He, God, will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. He also 
he has also prepared for himself deadly weapons. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. Yes, God will judge. God will judge with righteous judgment. He's done so before. He did so with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden where he cast them out when they didn't obey the Torah. You see, the Torah has been here since the very beginning. God gave instructions to Adam and Eve. That's what the word Torah means. We translate it as law, but it means instruction. God gave instruction to Adam and Eve. They didn't obey. They suffered the consequences thereof. Um, you can go throughout scripture and find out Cain and Abel. Uh, God comes to Cain and says, hey, sin is crouching at your door and wishing to have its way with you. What is sin? First John chapter three, verse four, sin is lawlessness. Those who practice sin also practice lawlessness. That word there in the original Greek is anomia, without law, without Torah. So again, if you want to know about the law, then you know what? You go to Psalm 119. And again, it talks about how blessed, how blessed are those whose way is blameless. Yes, you can be blameless. You don't have to be a sinner. You can be a sinner no more. How blessed is those whose way is blameless, who walk in the Torah of Yahuwah. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. You see, God came to give us life and give it to its fullest. Jesus said that I've come to bring you life and bring you to it, bring it to its fullest. How did he do that? By being the Torah. Matthew chapter five, verse 17, he says, do not think that I've come to abolish the laws nor the prophets, for I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. That word there, fulfill, in the original Greek is the word plureo. That means to make it fully known, completely make it known, completely preach it out, completely live it out perfectly. Why? So we could walk in his footsteps. If we love him, we should walk as he walks. Now, he said that he has a morality, Michael did, said he has a morality that is better than God's morality, than the morality that comes from the living, loving, logical, lawgiver God. I would love to talk about that. Well-being, who gets to define that? How do you define what well-being is? Imposing your will, why would that be wrong in a world where there is no lawgiver God? And could that ever change? You see, Moral laws are exactly like natural laws, like the laws of gravity, magnetism, thermodynamics. And I love science. I happen to be a science teacher. These laws do not change over time, just like God's moral laws never change over time. You said it can be sometimes right to lie. No, it's never right to lie. It's always wrong to lie. Even if you have uh, Jews in your basement and you're lying to the Nazis, it's still wrong to lie. But would I lie? I'd lie my butt off in a heartbeat because it's called weightier matters. God knows if we truly are doing something because we love him or we love ourselves. God says, and again, this is called the Shema statement. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and love others the way you love yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. Now, um, you also mentioned something called the Euthyphro dilemma, but we'll get into that momentarily because I believe my time is just about up. But I'm going to tell you right now, I agree with you in one area, Michael. This word of the living God is true. It's perfect. and You can bank on it. It never changes. It is the source of morality, reality, and truth. Thank you very much. Really do appreciate that, gentlemen. We will jump into the open discussion section. And I want to remind you folks, so sorry, at the beginning uh, I had not updated because this is a new watch page. So I have put the links for the guests. Those are in the description as well as the link to that Kickstarter that I had mentioned at the start of the debate. So head on over to all three links. And with that, we will jump into open conversation. Thanks so much, gentlemen. The floor is all yours. Uh, okay, so other than a sermon, I didn't hear any arguments for Christian morality. Um, but you said youth of dilemma. Do you want to talk about that first? Sure. So what, what, how, how would you answer the youth of dilemma? Is it, does God say it because it is good or is it good because he says it? Actually, sir, that's what's called a false dichotomy. 
you see, um, loving philosophy as well. Um, you have put God in a box that he does not belong in. I didn't do How shit. Do you... It's not even my argument. I'm sorry, sir. Sorry. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Once again, it's a false dichotomy. If you need to Google that, feel free. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, sir, that again, how do you define what is good without the God of the Bible? What is your definition of good and where does that come from? Um, well, I think my definition of good um, is a combination of the things that uh, the things that I listed, the four points. It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, you wrote them down. You should be able to follow them. Well-being, suffering, imposing will. Uh, that was the three I got, the main one. You also mentioned secular and no God. So well-being, how do you define what well-being is? And are you the I, only arbiter of, of what is well-being? Oh, no, absolutely not. And something else that you have to have, I, I didn't mention it, but it's pretty self-evident, is empathy. Um, like if, mm. if, you don't, if you don't give a damn about somebody else, like I got nothing, okay? But I mean, well-being, and again, I, 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 I talked about it, well-being whether you want to use the definition that is uh, a balance between mental and, and physical health or minimizing harm and maximizing flourishing. That's well-being. Okay. So who defines what is harm? Is being a pedophile, is that harmful, sir? Um, well, we got here already. Um, so I'm going to give you a very direct answer, but in order to do that, I need to know how you're defining pedophile. Pedophile, let's go with the worst case scenario, an adult such as yourself or I that mm -hmm. had sex with an infant. Would that always be wrong? Yes. Great. What On what basis do you declare that that would always be wrong? What if for some reason, somehow you could claim that that was good for society or that somehow, some way it was good for the people involved? And by the way, if you take the stance that it's always wrong and somebody else takes an opposite stance that it's always right, how do you know which one of you is correct? So I've addressed that already, one with empathy um, and two in, in the four points that I listed. So, so the worst case scenario that you said, Okay. Would that be maximizing that child's well-being or would it be, you know, would it be doing anything to help them flourish? Actually, what if it was? See, it's not about flourishing. But it's you about don't the even, design. But, yeah, but it, you I'm don't sorry, even sir. Think I'm sorry, sir. Is. Hello. Hello. I'm, I'm, and I'm don't sorry, even sorry, call sorry. me, sir. It's just Michael. Like, just don't go with the condescending. Sir. Sorry. We'll just, just, uh, we just will just, we will just basically go into three minute time sections just to be sure it doesn't go off the rails so sure okay. what we can do is i can't remember sorry i'm like split between the chat as well as uh the debate itself who had the sure. last kind of uh kind of me set of points you could say um i think Michael i think jim was ahead. in I think, okay oh, that, that's so, fine. all right so if we're talking about the worst case scenario that you said, and that would be, you know, a, a grown adult having, uh, having sexual contact with a child. Okay. Um, the reason why that's wrong is, is because one, it, it doesn't do anything for their well being. Okay. Um, it would be, it would, it would be involuntarily imposing your will on someone who could not consent. Do you have any kids? I have many, sir. Okay. So, um, when your children were young, you could recognize. I'm you could so recognize sorry to before, interrupt, but forgive yeah. me, forgive me, Michael. I'm so sorry. It's nothing yeah. that you've done wrong. It's just that I'm like, I don't know about the rules of YouTube in terms of like how bad these topics. Theoretically, like, could we use maybe just something like? Uh, this is a pretty deep and dark topic, such that. Sure. Is there something we could use, maybe even? Uh, just anything other than the, the, maybe this, just because sure, yeah, theoretically okay. Brian Stevens in the live chat says this is one that YouTube may uh, bring the hammer down on us hard for. Sure, no problem. Okay, so let's say that it's the worst case scenario and we're talking about a grown adult playing, uh, playing games with a child. Um, that wouldn't be doing anything to increase their well-being. It would, it, it would be harmful to them. It would also be uh, involuntarily imposing your will because, as you know, having young kids, um, they don't they don't always know at a young age what's good for them, and so they can't reasonably consent. Okay, and something like playing games is something you should have enthusiastic consent for. 
So they wouldn't be able to do that. So just based on those couple of things, that's how I can say it's always wrong. Um, once again, well-being. Yeah. Who gets to decide that? What if, again, sir, one moment. I'm not, I'm what sorry. if the society, what if the government says, uh, comes up and says, hey, this is in the child's well-being to go ahead and take them from a male gender to a female gender at eight years old. What if the government says that? Now, let's take it off the pedophilia issue and let's go to this issue right here. This is not in the child's well-being because you've destroyed the system. You see, I love science and your particular uh, position is all based on your uh, desires, your feelings. And I don't do feelings, sir. I do science. Now, if we're going to look at the system of sexuality, the sexual reproductive system is designed ultimately with an ultimate purpose. And let's see if we can figure out what that ultimate purpose is. Sexual reproductive system. So if you destroy that system, you now became a pervert. A pervert is any person who takes any system whatsoever and uses that system in a way it was never designed to be used which destroys or deforms the functionality of the system. If you are going to, again, the Bible calls it, rise up to play with a child in, in your euphemism, euphemism, or if you're going to take and try and change the gender of a child to something he was never designed to be, you just destroyed the system itself. You destroyed the sexual reproductive system. You just became a sexual pervert. Now, the thing you need to ask yourself is, who designed that system to function that way? Because once you go outside of its designed parameters, you broke the system and became a pervert, which is synonymous with a sinner. So once again, well-being, that's all based on your feelings. Your well-being, you might think something is a well-being of a child. Your neighbor might think the completely opposite. Who's going to agree upon that? Imposing will. You know what? When my children were young, I imposed my will on them all the time. I sent them to school against their will. I put them to, put them to the doctor against their will. I gave them shots. I took them to the doctor and got them shots and got them uh, well, was, well, was for their well-being against their will. And you know what? Sometimes I even spanked them against their will because they deserved punishment. And you know what, sir? That's what God does to us sometimes. Even against our will, he gives us a little trip to the woodshed. Now, once again, you also said something about consent. Well, if there is no law, if there is no absolute lawgiver to give you a law that it's wrong to take somebody's consent away, then why would consent even be an issue? Once again, let's look at something that's observable, testable, repeatable. The system itself, the system itself was designed for sexual reproduction. Would you agree, sir, that we are designed to be self-replicating organisms? I just want to make sure before I answer that, are you done? Like, do I get more than just a one word answer for, to this? Because you said a Certainly. lot there. Yes, okay. sir. So as, as I said before, for the purposes of this discussion, who designed it? God did. I accept that. Um, you, you said a couple of interesting things. Then you're things. not an atheist. Is that correct? You, you said a couple. Uh, I said for the purposes of this discussion. Um, I'm, I'm really hang concerned. on, dude, I'm, dude. You, okay, you wait. So wait no, it's my turn, right? No, okay, it's my great. turn, right? So no, my you're going right? to take my position and then you're going to. So I said, for the purposes of this discussion, okay, I'm assuming that this God exists, okay, and that the Bible is the accurate representation. Now, you said a couple of interesting things there. The first thing I want to point out is that you've dragged this away from ethics and morality because you realize your, your stance is indefensible when I take your position that, the God, that God exists, and so you try to switch it over to science interesting ploy, but it's not going to work. Second, you talked about uh, forcing your kids to go to school and giving them in, uh, vaccinations or uh, inoculations. Um, if we look at actually the, the, the framework that I put together, maximizing flourishing and minimizing harm, th that, that easily falls under those things. Inoculating your children is the least harm you could do because uh, measles, mumps, rubella, polio, all those things, those are way worse than the inoculation. And sending them to school, having a stupid populace is way worse than sending your kids to school when they don't want to go to school. Okay. So since you don't want to talk, since you want to try to drag this off of that, and I answered your question, and we can let the, the live chat decide whether or not I answered your question on pedophilia, we can move on to, to other stuff because there's way, there's way more fun stuff to talk about. So again, taking the stance that God exists, I'd love to talk to you about the Ten Commandments. Sir, but you don't believe that God exists. 
So since you don't so believe that God, I don't care about the purpose of this conversation, sir. Okay. I want to, I don't want to address my worldview. I want to address yours, your false worldview. Because when I introduced myself, I told mm -hmm. you, sir, that I am Mr. Batman, proclaimer of the Messiah and destroyer of false worldviews. You are picking up the shield of Christianity to hide behind it so you can protect your atheism. Now, sir, if there is no God, then there is no morality. If there is no God, then there is no time, space, and matter for you to observe any moral statements to be true. Now, if there is no God, you have no reproductive systems, no information inside the genome in order to be passed on. This is why I love science, sir. You cannot know what morality is without the God of the Bible. You cannot do science without the God of the Bible, sir. So I don't care about your for this discussion crap. I wanna deal with your worldview. Are you an atheist or are you not? If listen, I told you how I, how I was putting this talk together. If you don't like, you, I, I understand it's difficult for you because it's not difficult you, for me at all, sir. Because you can't do what it is you you want to do. I do it okay? all the time, sir. So, so for this, no, I, I accept that your God exists now. Okay, so you're not an atheist. Thank you very much for conceding. Uh, Game as, over. We're going to go into as the a, three minute timed sections. Uh, We'll give you a chance to finish, Michael, and okay. maybe we'll give you, I think you've probably got like maybe a minute and a half left, and then we'll kick it over to uh, Mr. Batman for a full three minutes. Sure, yeah. So the next thing I want to talk about, I'd like to, because as someone who believes in God, I've read the Bible a lot, and uh, something I want to talk about is, is, the, ten, is the Ten Commandments, because I'm having a real hard time with the, with the Ten Commandments. So just given the first four, Okay. I'd like to tell, I'd like you to tell me how the first four commandments have anything to do with morality. I don't need any more time, James. Go ahead. Sir, there's more than 10 commandments. There's over 600 of them. Sure. That yeah. This was only the ones that God got out before the people of Israel lost uh, their lunch and said, no more. Don't let God talk to us like that anymore. Or we're going to have a, a cardio malfunction of, of galactic proportion. Now, again, sir, the, the Ten Commandments are broken up into our relationship with God and our relationship with others. Again, you cannot know how to love others until you know how to love God. As a matter of fact, the whole first four commandments is about the Shema statement, Deuteronomy chapter four. As a matter of fact, I think I have that one saved. Uh, De Deuteronomy chapter six. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah, our Elohim, the, the Yahuwah is one. You shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words, which I'm commanding you today, shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets on your forehead. You shall write them on your doorpost. You're supposed to know this stuff, sir. Now, the fact of the matter is, this is about our relationship with God. We love God first, and then he tells us to love others the way we love ourselves. Jesus, when asked in Matthew chapter 22, was asked, Rabbi, what is the greatest of the commandments? He said, the first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is a condensed version of what I just read here. And then he said, the second is as the first, love others the way you love yourself. Now, here's where most Christians get it wrong. They stop right there and they say, oh, see, Jesus took it down from 10 to 2. No, he didn't. He said, on these two commandments, do what? Hang all the laws and the prophets, sir, all 613 of them. Now, uh, I don't know why you'd have a problem with any of them, sir, since you don't have a moral lawgiver and you don't have a reason why anything is wrong or right. You don't have a standard for good or bad, holy or unholy, clean or unclean. So is this my three minutes now? Please do. Okay. So, yeah, I, I do. Uh, and I told you what they were. And so you didn't address my question at all. So I'll address it instead. Um, so if we replace one to four with let's, let's put in a couple of interesting ones, like how about don't harm children? How about don't keep people as property like slavery? How about treat women equally? And how about don't be racist? Uh, so in 30 seconds out of 10 commandments, I have increased the morality of the 10 commandments by 40%. You still didn't answer the question about how the first four commandments, like, so love the, love the Lord your God with all your heart, okay? Have, no, don't have any gods before me. Don't uh, uh, make any graven images. 
uh, don't take the Lord's name in vain. And remember the Sabbath day. Those have nothing to do with other than I'm God. Don't piss me off. And like, there's, there's nothing to do with it. Those are not moral statements at all. They have nothing to do with well-being. They have nothing to do with any of the things that I've laid mm. out for a moral framework. So you decide and, and what's you moral. And you, no, and you can't answer it. No. You we, decide no, what's moral. No, I didn't say that I decide what's moral, but I did. Oh, yes, you, you did. You no, just told me that you, the, the Bible was wrong. So, so now you're you, deciding what's moral. So technically, I still have a minute and 45 seconds before you're Sure, go to right talk. ahead. But you're deciding what's moral by telling God he's immoral. But what's your definition of morality? Um, so I, I already told you that. Can it ever change? We do want Can it to, ever change? No. One sec. We, uh, we do, if he, uh, if Michael wants that minute 45 or now more like a, a minute 40. Minute and 20, yeah. So no, it's, so, so no, it doesn't, it doesn't change. But like I said, really? we, we also, we also, we also have to have empathy. Like I said, have you ever changed if, your mind? If before? we don't start with, so I'm, what I'm going to do is every time you want to talk, like did, did the middle of my sentence interrupt the start of yours? Sure. Yeah, have you ever changed your right. mind? Hold on one second. We do, we do want to give, we want to, we want to let him go Is it morally for wrong for me to interrupt 45. you? We, we can come back to that, but I do want to let him have that minute 40 or well, minute 10 seconds that's left. Yeah, whatever. Um, so like I said, we, we have to have empathy. We have to have empathy. We have to give a damn about one another. And then mm -hmm. when you apply those, like if, if you don't, if you don't want to do those things, I, I got nothing for you, but, but by applying those, but by applying those things, they are, they are so vastly superior to I'm God, I made you. So, so, and that's all there is to it. Don't piss me off where or I'll squish you. Don't, all right. don't piss we me do off have... or I'll squish you like a bug. So we're going to, that's what is 20 seconds. Where does it come? I hate to do no, this. It's, it's, but... it's fine. It's fine. Go ahead with your three minutes. Okay. We'll go for three minutes. So you're unmuted now, Mr. Batman. What is empathy and where does it come from? And how do you know? Are you wanting me to answer that question? Yes, sir. What is okay. empathy? Where does it come from? And how do you know? So again, for the purposes of, of this discussion. I don't care um, about the purposes of this discussion, sir. According to your worldview, your atheistic rejection of the God of the Bible worldview, what is empathy? Where does it come from? And how do you know? So one thing I've learned so far is that you don't listen real well. Atheism I listen perfectly well, sir, but I could care less about your opinion. Proverbs 18, 2. The fool, that would be you, has no desire for understanding, but only in expressing your opinion. Your opinion is irrelevant, sir, because you're trying to hold up the scripture and say, oops, I'm going to hide behind this book uh, because according to your world, no, I want your worldview, sir. According to your atheistic worldview, which you claim to hold to, where does empathy come from? What is its source? What causes it not to change over time? And what's going to cause it to be here tomorrow? So empathy, like all of our morality, is an emergent property. Emergent property of what? It developed over time. Uh, from what? I, I'm, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole. So Why you not, drag sir? This. Because you're, you're no. actually using okay. this empathy. Take and the saying, rest of your oh, minute and a half. Thank you, sir. You're using empathy and saying, we have to have this. We have to have this. This is, And it can't change over time. It's got to come from somewhere. You believe in magic. See, this is the problem with atheists like you. You simply believe in magic. Empathy just poofed into existence out of nothing. I'm sorry, sir. That's just plain stupid. Psalm 92, six, the stupid man cannot understand this. The fool cannot know you. The reason you want to take and consider the Bible to be true is so you can hide behind it and protect your atheistic worldview that you cannot defend. You see, without laws of chemistry, you don't get emotions without laws of, of biology. You don't get a brain that functions without this uh, multitude of systems, this plethora of systems, this irreducibly complex body that we enjoy, then you don't get to have a brain which you can use your empathy, sir. Oh, and by the way, before you can have empathy, you have to have laws of logic so you can identify what you're being empathetic towards. And then you have to have the law of non-contradiction so you can compare and contrast empathy with things you're not empathetic about. Oh, and it's either true that you're gonna use empathy or it's not. So that's the law of the excluded middle. So where do laws of logic come from so you can identify your empathetic position? You got 16 seconds, keep going. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies for they are ever mine. How's that, sir? Two, one, okay. Okay, 
Um, well, so, and, and this is your thing, like this is your one trick thing. Um, you, you keep wanting to go back to that. Because Truth like you, by its very like, nature is exclusive, okay, sir. Okay, dude, seriously, I got three seconds into it. Mm -hmm. And you still have... I hate to do this, but we do want to give him the full three minutes, Mr. Batman. So, you keep wanting to go back to this, just like you did with Jim Majors, just like you've done with other people that you've spoken to, because you, you, you can't. Like, it's, it's so clear to everyone who's watching and everyone who's listening that your position is so indefensible that you have to keep going back to these other things, right? I, I ask you to talk about where, so where, like how morality uh, is dealt with in those first four commitments and you can't do it. So you have to start talking about laws of logic. It's so pathetic. Um, so now I wanna talk about uh, something else. So I wanna talk about, um, you, you said earlier um, that you know, the you held the Bible said, you know, like reading the Bible and doing what it says. So in Leviticus, it says we should we should kill homosexuals. So I'm wondering how often you do that. Um, and I'm also I'm also curious about how you feel about slavery, because Exodus 21 and Leviticus 25, 43 through 46 clearly lays out, clearly lays out that keeping slaves is totally cool according to the God of the Bible. So I'm curious as to how you feel about that. And then there's some other real funny ones. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the story of the prophet Elisha. Um, but uh, this, the story is from, I had to write it down because there's so much stuff. Um, the she bears. Yeah, the she bears from Second mm -hmm. Kings. So um, basically a prophet of God gets butt hurt and God is sympathetic. And so I think it says 42 bears come out of the woods and rip the kids to shreds. They're not kids, sir. Um, well, it's, it says children, mm -hmm. and, and and even if it does doesn't matter, it they're wouldn't matter. If they're, it it's wouldn't a matter. Gang if they're, of it's a it gang of it's like it a would, gang you would have, sir. Right. So, cool. Okay. Like, where's the morality in that? We we have someone who gets butt hurt, and so let's not butt hurt, sir. Let's just kill them. Let's just kill them. I I can see the other fifty seconds. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Once but please, again, I would, please I would, do me a favor. Still, please I would still address love for, what I, would I still said. still love for you to answer the question of where your morality comes from. How do you know it's empathy to not take advantage of a person? How do you know it's empathy to actually do anything of any sort whatsoever? Because you can't identify your empathy. You can't identify what God's law is. It is time for the Lord to act, for they have broken your law. Therefore, I love your commandments. The word is a lamp to my feet. Oh, a lamp and a light to my path. I have sworn and I will confirm it. I will keep your righteous ordinances. Sir, once again, you can't define what is good without the God. That's why you have to keep going back to the Bible. You have no definition for what is good. This all started with your so-called attempt to ask what about the Euthyphro dilemma. There's no dilemma there. You have no definition of good. It's all based in your feeling, in your ideas, in how you want it to be rather than the way things actually are. In order for you to understand the physical world around you, then you have a few necessary preconditions that you've got to justify, sir. Like, where did the physical world come from? Where do laws of logic come from? Yes, I'll go back to that every time because you can't answer that from your atheistic, materialistic worldview. You said that empathy was an emergent property. Of what? When have we ever seen any emergent property, especially an immaterial emergent property, come from anything else? Where, when have we ever seen a law come from the physical. These are called metaphysical statements because they come from outside of the physical realm. They're never changing, but everything in the physical world changes. That's called the second law of thermodynamics. You can Google that. Google's your friend, sir. So once again, since everything in the physical world changes, these laws of empathy cannot come from the physical world that you're appealing to because then they would constantly change. And you told me yourself, it's always going to be wrong for you to rise up and play with a child. Now, once again, sir, if that's always going to be wrong, it cannot come from the physical world, which is constantly changing over time. Another problem from your worldview, sir. This is why you don't want to deal with your worldview. You only want to start from mine. You know, you, sir, want to steal from my worldview in order to prop up your fallacious one. Oh, and you can't even justify what a fallacy is because you don't know where logic comes from either. I concede the rest of my time if there is any.
So, so everybody listening and watching what we're learning so far is that um, Jim came to preach. And oh, yes, sir, actually, I did. And not to actually engage in any of the questions that I'm asking or any of the arguments that I've made. But I'm just going to keep on going. Everything you said. Hold on. Go we ahead. do it. We're going to do what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to basically put myself and uh, your, your uh, self, Mr. Batman, on mute as Michael goes through his three minutes. And then, given that Michael got us started, we'll give it to you, Mr. Batman, for the final few minutes. And then we will go into the QA. Okay, so let's see. Um, what else is there to talk about? There's, there's lots to, to talk about. Um, one of my one of my other favorite stories is the the story of uh, Jephthah from Judges 11. And one of the things that I find particularly interesting about this, and that I'm sure you'll have no problem just saying is moral, just because, like with everything else. Um, but everyone who's not familiar with the story of Jephthah, uh, basically he was going off to win a battle. Um, and uh, he prayed and said, uh, hey, you know, God, if you make me victorious, I'll sacrifice the first thing that comes out to greet me when I get home. And uh, even it's just, just in that, you want know, to talk about this, you know, this God, right? He, he knows everything. So he already knows what's going to happen. And it doesn't occur to God to say, um, Jephthah, are, are you sure you want to do that? Maybe, maybe not the first thing. Because the first thing that comes out to greet him is his daughter. Um, but you know, he made a deal with God, right? So, and instead of God saying, you know what, uh, I'll give you a mulligan on this one. Nope. Uh, his daughter goes off and has fun for, I think the Bible says goes off for, have fun for a month or something like that, comes back and her father kills her uh, as a sacrifice to, uh, to God for something he knew that was going to happen uh, anyway. So I find that really interesting. Um, so going back to the 10 commandments, go back to the 10 commandments for a second, because Jim couldn't answer why the first four had anything to do with morality. Um, but there are a couple of other interesting ones that are, that are interesting. I'm not calling it, you're, you're not cool enough to be Batman. Um, what, one of the other things I think is interesting about the 10 commandments is look at the one that says, honor your father and mother. Well, what if your mother and father are assholes and they're neglectful or abusive to you? Do they still deserve honor? Well, I don't think so. Um, and I don't think anyone else would, would think so either. And if you do, I think you have a weird idea on, on what uh, would dictate uh, honor um, in a situation like that. Um, let's see how much time do I have left. Uh, 25 seconds. Uh, that's fine. I can see the rest of my time. But just uh, in saying that uh, so far, we, we got uh, we got nothing from the other uh, we got nothing from the other side. Absolutely no no questions are answered. He calls. He calls the Euthyphro dilemma uh, a false dichotomy, but can't answer a simple question or any of the other questions I've asked so far. But we'll keep going. Thanks so much for that final clip. We will give a three-minute clip over to Mr. Batman. The floor is all yours. And then, as I mentioned, folks, we'll be going into the Q&A. We've got a lot of juicy questions, some interesting ones in there. So, Mr. Batman, the floor is all yours. Thank you, James. I do appreciate that, sir. Um, I'm going to quote scripture again, because you said you believe this. And of course, we've established that you're a liar. And there's nothing wrong with you being a liar because you have no morality, no basis for it. How long, oh, na naive ones, will you love being stupid? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing and fools hate knowledge. That would be you, sir. Turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. See, that's the word of this book, sir, the, the word of God, because I called and you refused. I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention and you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. I will also laugh in your calamity. You know what? God loves you, sir. God wants you to repent. God, God has made you know him. It's not a question. Do you know God? For what can be known about God is plain to you because God has shown it to you, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, his invisible attributes, hold on to that one for a second, have been clearly perceived, clearly seen ever since the creation of the world. So it's not do you know God, it's does God know you with every thought, every word, and every deed. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes, when your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me 
but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Yeshua HaMashiach alone. That's Jesus, the Messiah. For the waywardness of the naive or the stupid will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. You see, sir, you're making all these claims that you can't back up. In Eastern Kentucky, we call that you're trying to write a check you can't cash, boy. The fact of the matter is, sir, you have no basis for morality. You, you said that empathy was an emergent property of the physical world. I've already pointed out how that doesn't work. You said that well-being, that you get to decide who, what is well-being. Well, what if society changes it and says well-being is okay to rise up and play with a young child like the Bible talks about? Hmm. See, you said yourself that it's always going to wrong, be wrong to rise up and play with a young child, sir. Well, that's an eternal, universal, unchanging moral statement that only comes from an eternal, universal, unchanging moral law giver. How blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. Wow, wisdom and understanding. That's the Messiah. He came so you could know him. So you could be known by him. So you could know what is right and what is wrong. In Romans, Paul talks about this word being our schoolmaster. You see, sir, without this word of God, you don't have a definition for truth, for what is good, for what is bad, for what is well-being, or what is empathy. You have no definition for any of those things. You can't tell me where natural laws come from so you can even identify these things. You can't tell me where time, space, and matter comes from. Yes, sir, I am a, a one-trick pony. I'll be the first one to tell you that, sir, because truth never changes. Have a nice day.